Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lodger was veiled, the face was yellow, and the valley was fearsome, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder what kind of medical practice Dr. Watson actually ran? Or about the number of Holmes' monographs? Or how much the rent was at 221B Baker Street? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 310, The Root of the Blue Carbuncle. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into some of the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you rooting around for anything these days? I am. I'm down in the root cellar and I'm, uh, I'm trying to find out why that oak tree is growing in my living room floor. And there's a sword stuck in it. Oh, wait a minute. That was an opera. No, never mind. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, you know, when it comes to roots, um, we had this debate years ago when I worked at Ford Motor Company. We did a um, a, a live, uh, not well, not live, a, a uh, reality television and online program. And we it was with the uh, debut of the Ford Escape. And the show was called Escape Roots. And the CMO at the time, Jim Farley, asked me, Scott, is it pronounced Escape Roots or Escape Routes? I said, well, that's an interesting question. Because someone, be- someone routes someone else in a, uh, in, a, in a victory, or you, know, you follow uh, routing directions. But what's your preference, Bert? Is it route or route? Well, route is R-O-U-T, to route somebody in in an election. But route is R-O-U-T-E. So uh, I would think it's, it's a, uh, I, have, I have no real, pro, I, don't think I, I don't think I've ever said anything other than route when I mean way to go. But I would think it would be, you know, vernacular and, uh, and, um, in, in a way, probably regional. There are probably regions in the United States, considering all the accents and variation among the language, where there are people who say things like, um, you know, take that, take that route. Hmm. And but not me. Envelope. Yeah. Mm. Tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing root. Have a Coke, have a soda, have a tonic. Pop. Have a pop. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're not here to discover to discuss regional differences. We're here to discuss the root or route of the blue carbuncle uh, <laughs> of all evil. It's the root of all evil, and, and it is. And this is uh, this comes from uh, Seventeen Steps to Two Twenty One B by Gavin. Uh, is it by Gavin, Gavin no, Brand? It is. It is by Gavin Brand. Well, no, the book yeah. is it James Edward Holroyd or Gavin? Brand? Oh yes, yes. Holroyd's the editor. Holroyd yeah. is the the uh, the editor of the book, and we actually use this book in last month's uh, Mister Sherlock Holmes, the Theorist. We do one of these episodes every month. Uh, that episode was uh, episode three hundred five, and in it we talked about. Gosh, what was episode three hundred five when we were here last? Uh, it was Holmes and Watson. I got that much. And it was <laughs> our, 
client's foot upon the stair. That's what the uh, the last episode was. So, uh, because this book is not widely available to everyone, we thought we would take this particular piece of scholarship and discuss it together. Uh, before we do get to that, though, two things. One, the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash trifles310. And uh, there you can find all kinds of links, including previous episodes, including our Patreon, uh, which will get you eligible for thank you gifts, uh, for bonus content that's not available to uh, the public, and to regular prizes. And that brings us to the second thing, which is prizes. We forgot to do our drawing at the end of the last episode. Did you? Impossible. I know. Impossible. <laughs> forgot? Uh, well. Impossible. We were, we were rambling about, you see. <laughs> Um, that was the last episode. So uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, we did cover that and make it up to our uh, listeners. So uh, let's do what we do. This is a drawing for a free back issue of the Baker Street Journal. Every one of our Patreon supporters is eligible for it. And again, uh, the links to that are in the show notes or directly at patreon.com slash trifles. Uh, you just, it, Whatever amount that you choose to support us with, that creates eligibility for you in this contest. So, let's go to the random number generator and see what we get. Oh, you know, I'm amazed. This random number generator sounds exactly like our prize wheel from I Hear of Sherlock <laughs> Everywhere. And we get number 32 this time, which Ooh. corresponds to Sarah Proctor. Hooray! Hooray! Sarah, congratulations. Apologies for missing an episode on that, but uh, we did make it up to you, and uh, you will soon be a proud owner of a back issue of the Baker Street Journal. All right, the root of the blue carbuncle. Now, how did you happen to to, to come across this, this gem of a... Uh, <laughs> Of an essay, Bert. It took me years, really, literally, honestly, it took me years to figure out how to write a Sherlockian, a bit of Sherlockian scholarship. Uh, for some reason, you know, I've always been the sort of person where someone needed to explain the format of things. You know, what, what's, what's the structure? I've been a structuralist in writing. And that's very useful, of course, in speech writing and in writing for marketing and things like that. And for some reason, although I read an enormous amount of it, it always eluded me um, what the structure was until my friend Al Silverstein uh, explained uh, his view of what the structure of a Sherlockian paper would be. And so my particular hobby horse, as we have these discussions on trifles, is to encourage, hopefully, uh, our listeners to try their own hand at this for their own science societies, for their own amusement, and also for the Baker Street Journal and the Sherlock Holmes Journal and the Sherlock Holmes Review and the Sherlock Holmes Magazine and all of the enormous number of publications that could use content. So when I looked at this story by Gavin Brown, this essay, The Root of the Blue Carbuncle, I said to myself, this is a wonderful structure, and we should be talking about the structure in addition to the details. Because what Bren does here is he asks a question I don't want to say no one in their right mind would ask, but, but he asks, let's say for the sake of argument, he asks an unasked question and then vigorously proceeds to answer it. Um, with a lot of effort on his part. And so the way this began, and I thought this was a useful example to our listeners. So he begins by saying, on December 22nd in a year, which most of us believe to be 1889, the blue carbuncle vanished from the Hotel Cosmopolitan. And there's no positive evidence that it ever returned there. And the last view we have of this pretty toy is Holmes placing it in the strong box at 221B. But he was about to write to the Countess of Morcar, reporting the recovery, and says, Brand, I think she would still be at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. She, you know, uh, and so I like the idea of the carbuncle beginning and ending its journey at the same place. And so I'm assuming that this is what actually happened, and therefore the object of my essay 
is to trace its route or route from start to finish. <laughs> and he very helpfully calls it the Brend route. <laughs> uh, Gavin Brent. So, um, and yeah, and then he says, you know, it's not a subject on which I have passionate convictions. <laughs> But I'm doing this, you know, uh, as an experiment in the hope that it will start up rival theories and thus create a new controversy. And I just think, you know, that's a spirit that Nick Utekin and so many others have carried forth in uh, Sherlockian scholarship. Yeah, and and Gavin Brend, uh, I believe he was a member of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. And uh, this book was published in... Uh, the late 60s, I believe, 1967. And this may have predated uh, some of uh, what became later known as the Sherlock Holmes walks uh, throughout London. Uh, that what, what Brand proceeds to do, and we'll take you through the six stages of his walk here, is he traces, uh, as he said, the route of the carbuncle um, and of some of the main characters through the streets of London. And he uses landmarks, he uses street names, and he equates what we see in the printed page with what he physically can see and can discern in London itself. And I just think, having been to London myself and having purchased at one of the mystery bookstores there on my first visit um, four discreet uh, Sherlock Holmes walks that were, I think they were taken from the Sherlock Holmes Journal and published in these little pamphlet forms. Uh, these were wonderful self-contained walks that would take you uh, throughout the streets of London and point out what Sherlock Holmes would have seen, where he would have visited, some of the uh, eating and dining establishments, the hotels, etc. And it's a marvelous connection between what's in the literary page and what is in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Brand, those are those are terrific. And of course, we've talked to people on our other podcast, Trifles, who have also published books about Sherlock Holmes walks that you can do in London. Um, but Brand here in his essay gets right off and says, As I see it, the carbuncle was carried around London by a relay team of six people of whom only the first and the last knew what they were carrying. Speaking very roughly, the course is triangular in shape with the first and the sixth carriers heading south, the second and the third north, and the fourth and the fifth West. Then the successive carriers were James Ryder, Breckenridge, Bill, surname unknown, Henry Baker, Peterson, and the Countess of Morcar. And, and then I just got to this paragraph and I just love it. And then he says, in addition to these, there's a sort of reserve team <laughs> consisting of Mrs. Oakshot and Windigate and Mrs. Peterson and Holmes, who successfully, successively have the jewel in their possession, though they do not actively assist it on its journey. Mm. That's great. So, uh, briefly then, uh, let's go through the stages of uh, the, 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 uh, the Blue Carbuncle's uh, tour through the streets of London. He starts at, well, what he calls Claridge's. Mm. And he, he states after the, the stages, that he says, I take the Cosmopolitan which is where the Countess of Morcar stayed, to be Claridge's. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no doubt some other possible selections. The Ritz, the Carlton, the Berkeley, and the Cecil all came into existence after 1889, uh, though mm -hmm. some of them were built on the sites of earlier uh, hotels. The Savoy opened in October of that year, but it's unlikely, I hope, that within a couple <laughs> of months, a bedroom grate would already be in need of repair. <laughs> so he settles on Claridge's then as the uh, the main hotel. So first stage, uh, James Ryder uh, goes from Claridge's down Brook Street to Avery Row, Bond Street, St. James's Street, St. James's Park, Queen Anne's Gate, Broadway, Tothill Street, Dean's Yard, Great College Street, Millbank, Lambeth Bridge, Albert Embankment, Harleyford Street, The Oval, and... Brixton Road to number 117, where his sister lived. <laughs> and, of course, you would expect Brenda's timed this. 
and he times this at one hour, and we will be getting back to that timing. And that kicks off the second stage, which Bren says takes 48 minutes. So just to recap here, what's happened is Ryder has stolen the gem, and he's taken it to um, number 117 Brixton Road. So the, here's the second stage. From Brixton Road to the Kennington Park Road, Elephant, I don't know what Elephant is, Elephant and then St. George's Circus, Waterloo Bridge, Wellington Street, Russell Street, and then Covent Garden to uh, the shop. And these, this, is, this, of course, is uh, the geese. So the, the, the um, gem has been ingested by the goose at uh, Brixton Road and is now on its way to Covent Garden inside the goose. Right. And then the third stage is uh, Bill. Now, Bill, you may be asking yourself, who is Bill? Who is Bill? Well, Breckenridge refers to Bill. He says, get the books, Bill. So this is his assistant, his uh, one of his irregulars, as it were, um, an assistant. So um, Bill goes from James Street to Neal Street, uh, Shorts Gardens, Endell Street, Grape Street, Coptic Street, Little Russell Street to the Plow. Now, mm. the Plow, again, this is one of those substitutions. Of course, uh, Henry Baker talked about the Alpha Inn, uh, which was a, a public house where he participated in the Goose Club. And um, Brend has discerned that uh, among the constellation of pubs in and around the uh, uh, British Museum neighborhood, uh, the plow would uh, be a reasonable assumption. Uh, Christopher Morley, uh, just a few uh, decades before, had discerned uh, the Alpha was uh, the museum. Uh, is it the museum pub? Um, I don't remember that he named it. Did he name was, it? Uh, yeah, he did. And it's um, the Museum Tavern. Yeah. Ah. Um, but again, Bren says that, you know, this is part of the same constellation, and he prefers the plow himself. So hmm. uh, that, that stage, that third stage, took Bill nine minutes. <laughs> and then the fourth stage, Henry Baker is on the scene. Henry Baker is at the plow and picks up the goose. And we can say that's from Museum Street then to Great Russell Street, Tottenham Court Road to Googe Street. I love Googe Street. Hmm. And that was eight minutes, right? So mm, right. then we, uh, we find Peterson, who kind of picks up the trail of broken glass and Henry Baker's hat, uh, and he makes his way to Baker Street. This is the fifth stage. Peterson goes from Tottenham Court Road to Howland Street, New Cavendish Street, Blandford Street, and finally to Baker Street. Mm -hmm. That's 19 minutes. Mm. So the sixth stage then, Brend identifies as the Countess of Morcar. And this, of course, is the return of the gem from Baker Street back to the Countess of Morcar. And Brend, now bear in mind, all of this stuff is happening on foot. So Bren says, okay, well, the walk from Baker Street to Claridge's Hotel, which is, some of our listeners might not know this, Claridge's is, as we suggested earlier, a real hotel, and this is the route from, you know, approximately Baker Street and Marleben Road to uh, Claridge's Hotel, from Baker Street to Orchard Street to Oxford Street to Davies Street and to Claridge's, and that's 11 minutes. All right. Well, why don't we take a breather after that walk and uh, have a listen to our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll get into some of the details in these specific stages. Stay tuned. Yes, we're in the middle of one of those Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the Theorist episodes of Trifles. Where we're looking at a classic piece of Sherlockian scholarship. Well, where can you find classic Sherlockian scholarship? Now, there are a couple of places, and we can think of one of them right off the bat that's available right now. It's The Grand Game, Volume 2, which contains Sherlockian scholarship from a variety of sources, mostly the Baker Street Journal, from 1960 to 2010. Volume 2 is all that's left because Volume 1 was so popular, it sold out. 
We'll have more news on bringing Volume 1 back from the dead in future episodes. But for now, get on over to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and pick up your copy of Volume 2 of The Grand Game, covering the last half century of Sherlockian scholarship. You won't find better work in a single volume anywhere else. Go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and get The Grand Game Volume 2 today. All right, we're back, catching our breath. Um, I did mention those Sherlock Holmes tours. Um, you know, there's a wonderful supplement uh, to the Sherlock Holmes uh, journal. Um, it's A Tourist Guide to the London of Sherlock Holmes by Charles O. Merriman, who was past chairman of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. And uh, these are six different walks that appeared in the Sherlock Holmes journal in volumes 10 and 11, which would have placed them around 1970 or so, I believe, if I'm getting my volumes uh, dated correctly. Hmm. So, yeah. um, wonderful uh, collection there if you have a chance to, uh, to pick that up. So, uh, we were coming out of the sixth stage, and you mentioned that... Uh, this was calculated as being done on foot, and specifically Ryder having mm. his 40, was it a 48-minute jaunt? One hour, one hour jaunt mm. um, by foot, where he went from um, uh, from Claridge's to Brixton Road. Mm. Um, do you recall why Brend assumed that Ryder would have gone on foot? Yes, yes, and that's a great point. And I should point out to our listeners, some of you may be listening to this and saying to yourself, gee, this is pretty tiresome. You know, some guy with a map of London is just, you know, sort of sitting there with a pencil and working out from this street to that street. But there is a payoff here at the end. Part of the payoff is what's happening now, because after describing these routes, Bren now goes back and gives his reasons and rationales for making some of these assessments. And this is one of the ones that he does with Ryder. He says, you know, I've got a sort of sneaking sympathy for Ryder in spite of his somewhat unattractive character. I've always imagined him to be a lonely, impoverished type who probably spent all his spare time visiting his sister, who obviously spoiled him. And... um you know, he says in, in the case, um, Ryder says, all the way there, every man I met seemed to be a policeman or a detective, and for all that it was a cold night, the sweat was pouring down my face before I came to the Brixton Road. And this is Ryder with the gem in his possession on his way to his sister's in the Brixton Road. And so from this, says Brenda, I conclude that he was never able to afford any more comfortable form of transport, and that probably even the intervening journey in which he carried the wrong goose from Brixton to Kilburn would have been made on foot. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, that's a great observation. And, um, you know, he says, uh, I, have a, I have sort of a sneaking sympathy for Ryder, mm. uh, and despite him being an unattractive character. He said, I have always imagined him as a lonely, impoverished type who probably mm. spent all his spare time in visiting his sister, Maggie Oakshot, who obviously spoiled him, <laughs> as witnessed the retention of the largest goose for his disposal. Mm. Uh, if these journeys were always made on foot, I would think, uh, I think he'd, he'd learn to take the shortest course, and I have therefore tried to save his shoe leather by making him take what appears to me to be the most direct route for a pedestrian from Claridge's to Brixton Road. Hmm. Well, then Bren gets us into the second stage. He says, you know, was the second carrier someone from Brixton Road or someone from Covent Garden? And he says, you know, when Maggie is asked where the geese are, she merely replies, gone to the dealers. And so, uh, you know, if she or anyone else in her establishment had taken them, then this fact would have been mentioned. And if someone from Covent Garden called to collect them, there can be little doubt this would be Mr. Breckenridge in person. He's very businesslike. He would want to inspect his purchases. 
in person before buying. He would collect them in a cart. And if he really does live in Covent Garden, there seems to be no particular reason why he should depart from the main road via Kennington, the Elephant, and Waterloo. And then, and then Bren says, but does he live in Covent Garden? Um, you know, and... He points out that in the Sherlock Holmes Journal, others have pointed out that Covent Garden was a fruit and vegetable market and not a poultry market. And uh, Watson might have been confused, confused Covent Garden with Leadenhall Street. And, uh, you know, so Geb Bren says, basically, he doesn't come out and say this, but he says, I'm ignoring all that. And I continue on my course to Covent Garden, passing on the way the Lyceum with its third pillar from the left. Hey, that's you. That's me, the scene of a famous rendezvous in Sign of Four. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. Um, And I should note that um, in talking about that that detour, uh, Bren mentions the elephant. You had wondered about what elephant was. Well, that's that's a public house. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Like the Elephant and Castle we used to go to in Boston. Um, mm. So uh, he continues. He says, uh, Breckenridge's cart will be required again for the third stage of the journey. For we can't expect Mr. Windigate of the Alpha to have the facilities for collecting 24 geese. So it's, uh, it's DoorDash for geese where Breckenridge drops them off <laughs> at uh, the Alpha. Um, it'll be, and, and he says it'll be quite sufficient to have one of his assistants deliver the birds. So um, yeah. uh, there we have uh, Bill. Uh, yeah, he said, yeah, I, we, g- sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, he says, uh, I have a feeling you may have forgotten Bill or overlooked <laughs> him since he's a very small boy and only makes two brief appearances in the narrative. First, when he helps Mr. Breckenridge put up the shutters and secondly, when he hands him the books. We only knew him as Bill. Whether or not his surname is Breckenridge is one of the many problems, which I hope the Sherlock Holmes Society will supply the answer in the near future. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now we're sort of hurtling to the end, and uh, Bren tips his hat to Christopher Morley, as we mentioned earlier, identifying the museum tavern opposite the gates of the British Museum, and says, yeah, my preference is for the plow, as you pointed out. And now Henry Baker is in Little Russell Street. He takes a turn to the right. But I've routed him to the left, back into Museum Street, you know, to keep in step with Christopher Morley. And then, uh, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning, and it's been a really good party. And now Peterson takes over from Henry Baker at the corner of Tottenham Court Road and Goodge Street. But I I like how he says Henry... Henry uh, Baker will not object to the slight extra distance, but now he's past <laughs> objecting to anything. It's four o'clock in the morning, and it's been a really good party. <laughs> so, as you say, uh, Peterson picks up, um, and he says, "Now there's room for argument. Was it north or south corner? I choose the south." <laughs> Henry's clearly proceeding northwards along Tottenham Court Road. And if the roughs are coming out of Good Street on the south side, neither party will see the other until they run into each other on the south corner. On the other hand, if the collision occurred on the north corner, no matter from what direction the roughs approach, each party is visible to the other and has an opportunity of avoiding the other, if so desired. Now, you see, that's a really interesting uh, trifle, shall we say, because nowhere... Uh, other than a, an individual who is there on the streets of London, uh, would we have the ability to kind of uh, gin up this, uh, you know, imaginary uh, scenario where one might avoid the other? And it's it's just a really interesting observation that gets woven into the scholarship here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's one of the many things that I enjoy about this essay. And now, of course, we're hurtling to the end. We talk briefly about the commissionaire Peterson, and Bren talks about his assumptions about Peterson and the routes he took. And then he says, you know, so how did the carbuncle get from 221B to Claridge's? Um, You know, Holmes wouldn't send it to the countess by post. He was probably not involved and didn't want to deliver it himself. 
Perhaps the countess, he said, came to Baker Street to collect her pretty toy, and her carriage would probably find the main, follow the main roads, both going and returning. So that completes the route. Now, here's the payoff that I mentioned earlier. You know, you can look at all this and say, well, here's some fellow, you know, with a pencil and a ruler and just mapping this all out. But what does Bren say at the end? He says, this completes my route, which runs through five London boroughs. I have covered the distance in two hours and 35 minutes, <laughs> which, which I think I can reasonably claim as a world's record, since it is virtually certain that no human being has ever before walked this walk in its entirety. <laughs> I have just oh, bless him, this bless thing him. And, and followed it, yeah. and now I have the record, yes. Yeah, bless him. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's extraordinarily well done. It's a lot of fun to read, and uh, I think it just typifies what we hope to uh, share in these Mister Sherlock Holmes the Theorist episodes. Yes, and it's just after all a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Faces to the south, then, and quick march! 